Hello, I'm Angelica Bell and welcome to the Royal Bank Business Show. Well, joining me today is a very special guest, Stephen Bartlett. He is the entrepreneur of the moment. He's the newest and youngest ever dragon in the den, a number one author, and also hosts one of the biggest, if not the biggest podcast in the UK. But now it's his turn to sit under the spotlight. Joining us to discuss how he overcomes obstacles and sees failure as a positive, Stephen, welcome. Stephen, you barely need an introduction, but we do ask each of our guests to tell us their journey in 60 seconds or less. Do you think you can manage it? Are you thinking 60 seconds is not that long? You looked, you were like, hmm, will I manage it? I'm going to just time 60 seconds. Just to make <laughs> do you know what? I knew you were going to do that. Did you? Yes. Why, why did you know I was going to do that? Because yeah. obviously we've met and you you liked challenges. So you're going to, I do like challenges. Yeah. Okay. Tell me when to go. Okay. Go. My journey. Okay. So i um, born in Botswana in Africa, moved to the UK when I was a baby. Um, grew up in Plymouth, very insecure child, I think, in hindsight. Only black kid in an all-white school, poorest family in the area. Started a company when I was maybe 14, 15, 16. These were kind of like small, just, you know, selling things, putting on events. Became very entrepreneurial in the absence of my parents. Um, at 16, I, I get kicked out of school. Um, I, I get unexpelled because I make the school a lot of money. Um, at, at 17, I get kicked out of school again, our sixth form. And I go off to university at 18, drop out after one lecture, start a business, it fails. I pivot that business into a business called Social Chain, which succeeds. I run that business for seven years. I move all around the world and fly all around the world with that business. I resign at 27, start a new company called Flight Story, start another company called Third Web. I DJ, I join Dragon Sen, start a podcast, start a fund, start a psychedelic <laughs> company. And now I'm doing this book. <laughs> That's <Like> good. <laughs> it does help when you've got, you can see it, the clock going down though, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. usually let everyone have a, a countdown. <laughs> but through that little synopsis, um, Stephen, you are known for getting through some immense challenges and coming out the other side to achieve success. Why do you think your story has had such an impact on so many people? Um, I think it's probably largely the way that that one tells it um, that has the greatest impact. There's a few ways to, to, to tell my story. One of them centers me as the hero and someone that is um, perfect and that is immune from failure, anxieties, doubt, all of those things. And then there's another way to tell it, which is the truth. And the truth is much more resonant with everybody, vulnerability, openness, honesty, admittance of one inadequate of one's inadequacies and all of that stuff is much more resonant. Um, and I think that's probably why it resonates. And then I think generally, um, because, and this is the case from the people that have become my role models, because I did not come from a background that is unattainable um, to most. That is, um, you know, I didn't come from a silver spoon. We didn't, we never had any money. I didn't have birthdays and Christmases and presents like a lot of my friends did. Um, because of that, I think, it acts as a bridge to some people that there's no reason why they can't do. I'm not, I don't have a degree. I didn't get good grades at GCSE. I forged my GCSE certificate. Um, I'm not good at maths. I'm not good at English, which I think will surprise some people, but I can't spell well and I can't do maths well. I'm sure that you can both spell pretty much. I bet 95% of people listening to this can spell and do maths better than I can. Um, but I did have some skills and most of the skills that I have are actually skills that anybody can can go and learn um, just by repetition. You know, you just say it as it is, which I think for some people is quite, you know, shocking because, you know, we do live in a world where everything is glossy, don't you think? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's much easier to sugarcoat things because there's a perception of risk when you're either vulnerable with, about your own truth or you're honest about the nature of like the world and your perspective. It's much easier to stay within the herd in every sense of the word and to identify with, within the herd. But there is a cost to that as there is a cost to everything. There's a cost to like not expressing your own identity. There's a cost to um, all forms of non-expression, even with your sexuality. So the, I think you can definitely correlate people's fulfillment to the amount in which they're living within the, the parameters of their authentic self. And the more like I've played the experiment of being myself, the happier I've got, the more I've like drawn things to me that are meant for me, people in my life. We probably all can relate to a time where we were 
conforming, maybe even in school. I remember I did a lot of conforming in school, a lot of listening to music I didn't like and wearing clothes I didn't like to fit in, um, to, to fit into a crowd. And the reality is it doesn't, it doesn't take long of doing that for you to feel the consequences of it, as I've learned from my podcast. So I don't think it is a risk to be yourself, to express who you are, to say what you think. I think it's, it's actually the path to, to all the good stuff. Now, Stephen, lots of people with small businesses will be listening right now who have a lot at stake, um, have setbacks, and they're scared. They're scared to, you know, get started, get off the ground. So what advice would you give to someone currently too scared to fail? Um, I think typically when you ask small business owners, they don't admit that they're scared to, to start at least because of failure, they tend to come up with an excuse. And the excuse sometimes sounds like, oh, I'm just waiting because I need to find a mentor or um, I'm just waiting for, you know, this thing to happen at work and then I'll start or I'm just really, really busy right now. But um, so what I'm saying is it's not that they're, they're not scared because they are scared, but they just don't admit that to themselves. So they use other things. They put other objects in their way as plausible in their mind excuses for not starting. The truth is there's like some kind of psychological discomfort associated with starting. Um, and that is the case with all procrastination. As Nir Eyal, who wrote a book called Indistractable, told me, we actually live our lives um, of trying to avoid things that are associated with psychological discomfort. So if you know you've got an essay to do, for example, or a business to start, what you'll end up doing is cleaning the house. You'll take a path associated with less psychological discomfort. So you'll end up cleaning the house, doing the dishes and everything else, but the task associated with psychological discomfort. So the first step is really getting clear on what the psychological discomfort is as it relates to starting that business. What part of it is it that is, is intimidating you um, to the point of procrastination? And it tends to be the case that when we think about starting a company, we, we it feels like we're stood at the, the foot of Mount Everest. There is just everything to do. I need to think of a name. I need to raise investment. I need to find someone to help me. I need to do this logo. I need to start the Instagram pages, the marketing, everything. And that feels like Mount Everest. The reality is, and the way to kind of diminish that psychological discomfort is to break it down into small pieces. Instead of it being Mount Everest to climb, just a couple of pebbles you need to move out your way every day. Um, when I when it comes for me to starting a business, step one is always the same. It's always make a 10-page document, a 10-page deck. Can't be bigger than 10 pages, can't be smaller crystallizing exactly what this idea is, why I'm doing it, who I'm doing it for, and how I'm going to deliver it in 10 pages. The first page is usually the logo. So that's where you think of the name. And the next pages are exactly what you want to do. The importance of that is it from a bird's eye view, when you're looking down on your idea, you can see holes and you can make connections that you can't when it's just rattling around in your head. The other really important idea of that um, point of that is you're going to have to tell a thousand or more people about your idea before it even launches, usually. You know, whether it's on stage, whether it's on social media, whatever, whether it's investors in an inbox, whether it's people you're trying to hire and to have your idea perfectly summarized in a concise deck so that you don't have to rely on your messy verbal sort of um, uh, delivery of the idea in on the side of a street or on a road or over email um, is really, really important. And in the case, in my case, I must have told 20, 30,000 people about my idea before I started um, and at first I was like emailing them it or trying to tell them on the phone. When I got to the point where I had that deck, I could just say, what's your email? I'm going to send you the idea in it's perfect form. So that's what I do. I break it down in, uh, into small pieces, but piece one is just making that deck for myself and for others. I just want to go back to what you were saying about procrastination, because I just want to know what you thought about people growing, you know, people sort of cultivating that mindset to fight procrastination because it, it it is one of the things that sort of holds people back and they don't achieve. But, you know, you're very focused, but some people don't have that naturally. So what would you say to them? Um, the most useful thing that I've discovered once I realized that truth, which is procrastination is the avoidance of psychological discomfort, is to just ask myself literally out loud, what is it I'm avoiding? And it's And you almost have to ask it out loud. Um, because sometimes it's it's just a feeling. But when you look at the task and you go, why would why would this particular task, learning to DJ, learning that language, learn, doing that essay, starting that business, why is this particular task giving me psychological discomfort? Usually it's because we don't feel like we have all the information we need to begin. Um, that's often the case. We don't feel like we have the resources we need to begin. And so once you're clear on exactly why it is, then you can start to take steps to rectify that and really attack the discomfort. So in the case of 
me DJing. One of the things, you know, the DJ decks have sat on my counter for 12 months now and I've, I've been learning. But at the start, it took me about four months just to like plug it in. And it was because I didn't feel like I didn't know which wires I needed and I didn't know how to connect to my computer and I need the software. So I'll just do it tomorrow. And so to, to counteract the psychological discomfort as it relates to DJing, I went, I booked a class and I went on one Saturday and a guy just showed me. He walked me over that sort of mental psychological discomfort. And once he'd done that, I was off to the races and I've been, you know, learning to DJ ever since. But there was that initial hurdle to get over. Um, once I was clear on why I was doing it, then I could rectify it. How good are you now? Oh, unbelievable. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> you know, three, three, three to four out of 10. Well, you are a perfect example that despite failing in one area of your life, it doesn't mean you have to give up. And I was wondering if you could give our listeners three ways they can actively reframe a failure. So from a negative to a positive, how can you turn that around? Well, failure is in fact the thing that we, I personally measure most in my life and especially in my companies, like what is our failure rate? Because we realize that the amount in which we fail is the amount is like each failure is a step close to the correct answer in business. So um, it's actually the case that organizations that are failing faster and people that are failing faster are arriving at the, the right answer much, much faster in their lives. And if you think about, let's say we've got a market, this, this podcast that I'm doing right now, there's no book written on it. There's books written on how to market a podcast, but books take two years to publish. So those are redundant already because the world has changed. Platforms have changed. YouTube changed this week. Podcasting changed this week. So just, just logically, the people and teams that are failing the fastest, conducting the most measured experiments and getting the answers the quickest are the ones that are going to be at the right answer. So for me, failure is actually a predictor of success. Are we out failing our competition? Um, as it relates to how we market our podcast with the trailers, how we book guests, how we do the thumbnails, how we do the titles, are we conducting more experiments and out failing our competition? If if the answer is yes, we're always going to have the right answer before them. We're always going to know more um, and therefore we're going to get better results because failure is feedback and feedback is knowledge and knowledge is power. So uh, logically, failure therefore is our power. And um, those aren't just words. That's how that's the philosophy of of all my teams is like, how do we increase the amount of experiments we're doing? How do we increase the amount of uh, how, how much we're failing? Um, because that is the path to the correct answer. So you think failure is success and power? Well, failure is feedback and feedback is knowledge and knowledge is power. So therefore, failure is power. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. There needs to be a certain level of... Um, of understanding of what the actual risk is um, when you when you think about failure, because a lot of people don't know what the risk is. So in biz, in the context of business, people think the risk is the experiment going badly. Um, the risk is actually usually in business the time you waste trying to decide whether to do it or not. The procrastination is usually the risk. So you know I've worked in companies before. I've, obviously, I spent ten years helping companies do their marketing. So I got to see up close and personal why some companies won and why some companies didn't. I was in the boardroom with. I was going to name the brands, two brands that you'll know very, very well. Um, one's run by the dad, one's run by the son. I think I, I talked about this. Yeah. And the son biz, son's business, he was just so quick to conduct every experiment and fail. Whereas the dad would take nine months to decide whether just to do that one experiment and then the dad would fail. But the son was already on to so many other experiments within the company to try and find that right answer and to get the results that the son's business took off and became this billion dollar company. And the, the dad's business has, has been a bit flat ever since. So the real risk there wasn't the failure. It was procrastination. It was waiting. And that's often the case in our careers, as you've kind of described. The risk is not taking the shot, not someone emailing you and going, sorry, you didn't get it. The risk is uh, procrastinating, uh, going to the audition or applying. That's that's ultimately the risk. Um, and we, we always miscalculate the risk. This is just one of the things we, and usually we miscalculate the risk um, based on ego and reputation. So if we think something's going to embarrass us, we hold, we weight that as a much greater risk than, um, than many other things. Uh, and once we can kind of humble ourselves a little bit and remember that this isn't about validation, it's about forward motion, then we can start to hopefully rebalance and sort of re, um, reanalyze that risk assessment. 
So Stephen, we've been asking our followers to send in some questions for you. And this one has come in from one of our listeners. It's from Patrick. He says, what are your top tips for starting a side hustle in 2023? Um, I'd say the most important thing generally, whenever you start anything, is just to make sure it's something that, that you actually care about and you're doing it for the right reasons. This sounds, I've heard this advice for many, many years, and I've never really sounded kind of fluffy the first couple of times I heard it. And I thought, oh, why do people say, oh, you know, make sure you love it or follow your passion or these kind of cliche things. But the truth within it is, um, it might not pay you. It might not pay you for one year, for three years, for five years. Um, but it'll also at some point become incredibly difficult. So something that doesn't pay you and inevitably becomes very, very difficult. Um, you're not going to carry on doing it if you don't love it. That's going to be the, the anchor. That's going to be the thing that regardless of the storms keeps you, keeps you at it. And keeping at it is how we arrive at mastery. Mastery is how we arrive at payment. So it has to be something that you love um, and putting that first and foremost will allow you to weather the storms. It'll allow you to become a master in whatever that thing is like DJing, for example, I genuinely love it. And I tested myself for a long time. I thought, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And there was about six months in of doing it and like sitting with it where I go, do you know what? Let's go all in because I absolutely love this and I can't stop thinking about it. Um, that's when I take it off the Sunday shelf and, and commit to doing it. So yeah, that would be number one. Um, yeah. And the point of mastery, I can't emphasize enough because when you just are genuinely curious about something in your own time and you're not doing it for money, that's when you start like watching the YouTube videos at 1am in your boxer shorts. That's when you start list, you know, following those people. That's when you, and that is the path to mastery of a side hustle. And your side hustle can very quickly become your main thing. Um, if it is something that, you know, you're willing to be patient enough to master. Yeah. Patience is key. Yeah, it's always key. But I mean, I, I mean, two truths can be true at the same time, right? And um, two things can be true at the same time, even if they're contradictions. It, patience is super key, but also impatience is key. What's your dream? What's your like North Star? Difficult question, isn't it? You, I think some of what you said resonates because I think I've always been, I think I've always just been trained to be grateful for different reasons. And yeah, yeah. so, and also I've never said, I think maybe I'm always, I've, I like sitting in that comfort zone because I don't want to put myself out there and say, I want to do that. And people are like, you'll never get that. No, uh, yeah, I've heard this before and it's really, the I really don't like it. It really hurts my soul to hear that. Because it's like a limiting of oneself, isn't yeah. it? It's like your potential is like, it's, it's like putting a plant in a box. But recently know? I have started to think, actually, I've got nothing to lose. I agree. I think you've got the world to gain because I don't think I mean, it's nothing to lose. Again, we go back to like the risk question. What is really the risk? And it all comes. So the biggest risk is the big thing you should never risk is being uh, is, ha is happiness. That is the thing where you go, I'm not prepared to risk that for anything. And so if you ever find yourself in a situation where it's certain, you've got a lot of certainty, you know, it, you're comfortable, but it's a bit miserable, then there's no risk. Yeah, true. No risk. Are you happy? Is, Are you happy yeah. now? Yes. There's nothing yeah. else. There's no void, nothing else you want to. I, you know, I'd be honest, right? Yeah. You know, I, I would, if I, I wish I could say something. I wish I, I wish there was something that I could say that where I was like, oh, I want to fix that. But I found myself in a situation very fortunately now where I, I'm in a relationship where I think I'm going to marry the person and I can, I just absolutely <gasps> love. Um, I, I do work that I absolutely love. I get to do a podcast where I talk to the, the most interesting people in the world. I work with these people that I like every day. I have real, real flexibility in my life. I can say no to anything I don't want to do. And I'm like living in my Ica guy. So I'm like, and I'm also getting to express myself in all of these really artistic ways, like writing my book, doing the DJing, doing this live tour, which we've, we're building at the moment. Like I, you know, it's not to say my life isn't without struggle because struggle is an important part of happiness. I yeah, never because, want my life to be easy. Because you can't, I don't think you can understand true happiness unless you un you've understood sad. Do you know what I mean? You like, it's quite what you said. You have to have the, the flip side. A hundred percent. 100%. And, and with everything, with everything great comes, it's like everything has a cost. My girlfriend's going to, this sounds like a morbid thing to say, but in, in the decision to love her, I'm also making the decision that someday she might die and that I would have to deal with that. And like, that's just the nature of everything I've, I do, even in the decision to go on Dragon's Den or to, to be more in the public eye or to be successful with the podcast. I'm also accepting the decision that thousands of people will hate me and they will tell me they hate me. I don't have the hate for that. But everyone does, right? Like you, yeah. some, my Instagram, I'm sure if it wouldn't take me long enough scrolling for someone to tell me that my hair is or something. Do you know what I mean? Like, 
you know, but this is it. Everything has a cost. There's no, there's no Nirvana where everything is just perfect. So, um, yeah. And I, I like the cost. The cost is important. Life would be so sh- if there was no cost, if there was no struggle, if there was no doubt or fear, it would be so shit. Difficulty makes us motivated. Like you wouldn't play a video game on the same level of difficulty every day. Yeah. You want to move forward. Cool. You want to go higher. And you want to struggle and you want to climb like our ancestors did. You want things to be difficult and challenging. Going back to your point, you, you're a star. So look, you've already gotten to a place that most people can't get to. And with that, for me, comes a responsibility to like, go for it. You know, very few people even get to it. So gratitude is the way you go, okay, we're just going to play defense. But on the other hand, listen, I've got to somewhere pretty much everyone wants to get to, but very, there's very few seats at this table. So I have, a, I have a responsibility to go for it, you know, for myself, but for others, for like all of the people that look at you as inspiration, you have that responsibility as far as I'm concerned. And I have a feeling you'll, 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 find, the, you'll find a lot of fulfilling things on that journey. So, Steve, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? It's funny because I probably wouldn't even know, you know, and I say that because I, I, I've received advice in so many ways from so many things, but um, I continue to get advice, really good, great advice from everybody around me, from friends, from best friends, from whoever it might be. Um, although the best, the quote that stayed with me the longest um, was those who think they can and those who think they can't are both usually right. And I just, I believe this to a point that it's controversial. Like I believe that so much that it's that if I expressed how much I believe that just because of what I've seen in my life and going back to what I said earlier about like, I didn't, I wasn't good in school. I don't have grammar, I'm not smart. Um, I'm capable at things now because I did them loads. I did them over and over and over again, even speaking, even like the articulation of ideas, even knowing what the word articulate means. This is all just repetitions of like doing interviews and committing myself for many, many years. Um, but that phrase, those who think they can and those who think they can't, was the thing that made me understand myself. Because I, the one thing I did have, okay, I can't spell, can't do math, can't do this, I'm not smart as my brother is, is I genuinely believed that I could. Stephen, thank you so much for being on the show today. You've been amazing and we really appreciate all the advice you give. Thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's an honour. I don't do many of these, but it's, um, it's been a pleasure to do it with you. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. And as always, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chat, why not go back and check out our previous episodes or head to our website to find out more insights and potential solutions that could help you take action today. Until next time.